Hello, <laughs> and welcome to NOAA's National Ocean Service Science Seminar Series. Um, I'm going to jump right into it. I'm going to skip some of the things because we had a little bit of a late start. The presenter today is fine with clarifying questions during the seminar. Go ahead and type them into the chat box. Um, or if you have any other concerns, type them into the chat. And if you're interested in getting a PDF copy or MP4 of today's presentation, please contact me at tracy.gill at noaa.gov. I will be happy to send you a copy. Um, and so today's seminar is titled Chesapeake Dolphin Watch, Dolphins in the Chesapeake. And our speaker today is Dr. Helen Bailey, Research Associate Professor at the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory, part of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And here's a little more background on Helen. Helen Bailey has published over 50 journal articles specializing in marine mammals and sea turtles. She received her BA with honors in biological sciences from the University of Oxford, her MS in oceanography from the University of Southampton, and her PhD at the University of Aberdeen for her work on the habitat use of bottlenose dolphins. She subsequently studied the underwater sound levels and environmental impacts of offshore wind turbines on marine mammals. Dr. Bailey received a National Research Council postdoctoral award to study migration pathways and hotspots of marine predators at NOAA as part of the Censors of Marine Life's Tagging of Pacific Predators project. She joined the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science in 2010, where her research focuses on studying movement ecology, patterns of habitat use, and behavior of marine species, and its application to management conservation. Welcome, Helen, and thanks for presenting your work at the NOAA Science Seminar today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I, I was going to start with a little bit of a story of, of how we did get here uh, to Chesapeake Dolphin Watch. It is a running joke in my family and is becoming one in my research group that if dolphins are spotted, it's usually when I'm not around. <laughs> and um, I grew up on the south coast of England uh, where my dad was a very keen sailor and he knew that a great way to entice me onto a boat was to say that we were going to go and spot dolphins. So we went on numerous trips along the coast, across the channel to France, and all over the place. Um, I have never seen dolphins with my dad. <laughs> but um, but on one, after one particularly rough trip, um, my mom and I finally said we had had enough and we were going to take a plane back. <laughs> so my dad agreed. He got a friend to, to go with him to take the boat back, and my mom and I flew back. And almost as soon as we landed, we got a phone call from my dad saying that he'd just seen hundreds of dolphins <laughs> all around the boat. And we laughed until he came home and he had the photos and video to prove it, that yes, indeed, there were the dolphins. And I feel like that's happened a little bit to me recurrently. So the first time that I saw dolphins off Britain was actually off Scotland. And that's where I did my master's research and my PhD research. And that's Northern Scotland is about as far as you can get from the south coast of England in Britain. And then when I came over to the US, I was actually first in, in California, and I was working at the NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center. And, and through the, the top project and after it, I was working on blue whales uh, with NOAA and Oregon State University. And that continued as I moved to the University of Maryland in 2010. And for about four years, we were studying blue whale movements and distribution off California. And, and of course, it was not until some time later that I realized how frequently there were marine mammals right off our doorstep. If I just walk out the building, I can see at the Chesapeake Biological Lab there have been dolphin sightings right there in the Patuxent River. So I'm going to be talking a little bit today about how we got to that point, how we created this project, and what we've learned so far, and what we're hoping to learn in the future. So I move to the next slide here. Um, I'm going to talk firstly um, an introduction very briefly to, to what we've been studying in our dolphin research, how the project got started. I'll tell you a bit about the acoustic monitoring that we've been doing and the results that we have so far. And then I'll talk about our um, bottlenose dolphin sightings that we've been collecting through a citizen science project. So on the next slide. So introduction to our research. I think there's been two main aspects to our research. Um, the first being the passive acoustic monitoring. 
um, where we've been using a couple of different devices to record underwater sound to monitor the, the ambient noise levels as well as the occurrence of dolphins and the different sounds that they're making. And then we've also been getting um, dolphin sightings from around the bay through our Chesapeake Dolphin Watch app. But what I want to do is take a step back and go on to the next slide where I talk about how, how did we get to this point of looking at dolphins in the Chesapeake Bay. And it actually started with work I was doing um, offshore of Maryland in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, as Tracy mentioned, uh, when I was in Scotland, I'd been doing work uh, looking at the impact of the installation of an offshore wind farm on marine mammals and seabirds. And um, so I had an interest in offshore wind and I had been monitoring its progress in the US. And there was an opportunity uh, to work with Maryland Department of Natural Resources, Maryland Energy Administration, and uh, BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, to do baseline acoustic monitoring for marine mammals um, offshore of Maryland in the Maryland wind energy area. And before you throw any expensive devices in the ocean, it's always a good idea to test them. <laughs> um, so prior to um, deploying our devices, we did lab testing, uh, but we also did a deployment of our pier. So you can see in the picture on the, the left, um, we're, looking, we're at the end of the pier and we're looking back uh, towards shore uh, to the Chesapeake Biological Lab, which is in Solomon, Southern Maryland. And initially, we were testing those devices in the, in the late 2014, and then we bought some additional devices in case there was any loss uh, at sea that we tested of summer 2015. And that's when it got really interesting. So some of these devices called C-Pods are dolphin click detectors. So they're not as easy to test in the lab. We don't have any dolphins in the lab. So putting them out to sea, we thought, well, well, even if we don't have dolphins, we'll at least just check they're working. Um, and what we were surprised to find is we were actually getting fairly frequent dolphin detections on these devices. And we were only deploying them for a few days to a week at a time initially just to make sure they were working. Um, but as it became more apparent that this was a continuous pattern of detections, uh, we decided we, we needed to investigate this further. When I joined the Chesapeake Biological Lab, I remember asking one of the faculty, oh, do you, do you see dolphins very often? And he was like, oh, you know, they're, they're very rare, just occasionally people will see them. And I knew from the um, stranding program that there were strandings off Maryland, but, but many of them are off the Atlantic side. Um, and, and those that do occur in the Chesapeake, it was often unsure whether they really had been in the Chesapeake or they had just washed up there. Um, and I, so I, I found relatively little information on dolphins in the Chesapeake. But what I will do is I'm going to divert just, just for a moment to continue what I was saying about the project offshore because I thought that might be of interest to folks at NOAA too. So what was happening with the devices that we were testing is we were then deploying them offshore of Maryland off Ocean City. So in the little map there, you can see Ocean City, and we've got the Atlantic coast here, and the green box shows the Maryland lease area. And this was auctioned by Boehm, and the lease was won by the company US Wind. Um, that uh, auction had not occurred when we, when we first started deploying acoustic recorders, and we deployed them approximately 10 to 60 kilometers offshore. Uh, I knew from the work that I'd done in Scotland that the effect of sound would travel far beyond just the turbine area themselves. That if we were really going to get an idea um, of baseline data in the area of potential effect, we needed to look far more broadly. And that's why we had sites both inshore and offshore of the wind energy area. And we collected that data for three years continuously, November uh, 2014 to 2017. And then we had um, additional grant funding to do monitoring in summer of 2018 and 2019. So we've, we've collected a lot of acoustic data offshore now um, on the ambient noise levels and on marine mammals. So I'll just show you um, here that the type of devices we're using because so then when I talk about our Chesapeake work you'll, you'll be familiar with some of these terms if, if you aren't already. Um, marine mammals, vocal, different marine mammal species vocalize at different um, sound frequencies and 
In an effort to try and get as much continuous data as we could, we therefore decided we would use different devices and sampling rates to try and, and maximize our um, acoustic recordings whilst minimizing the, the cost of, of going out there and retrieving and redeploying. So we used the, the Cornell University MARU devices, uh, which were sampling at 2 kilohertz. This was primarily aimed for baleen whale calls and also for that low frequency ambient noise. Um, they were continuously recording at 10 sites, which I'll show in a moment. We then had the C pods, um, which are made in the UK. These are echolocation click detectors for odontocetes. Uh, we specifically were, were focusing on, on the dolphin and porpoise detections for those. And the great thing about C pods is even though we're monitoring at high frequencies, which means it's very memory and battery hungry, um, these can record continuously for five to six months because they're not recording the whole sound stream. They have an onboard processor, so they're um, characterizing the sound, and once you download it, you can then identify where, when the, the dolphin click trains occur or the porpoise click trains occurred, uh, but it means you can be having this very high sample rate but, but getting detections for a, a long period of time. And then finally, we had acoustic recorders sampling at 48 kilohertz. Um, so this was the, up to the, the mid-frequency range. Um, so we would be able to detect other dolphin sounds, like dolphin whistles and other calls, and also get ambient noise measurements uh, for, for up to those more mid-frequency ranges. But as I said, it, it, when you're sampling at that rate, it does use up memory and batteries. So we usually had to duty cycle our acoustic recorders in order to get a three to four month deployment period. So um, the next slide here shows you where those devices were deployed. The baleen whales were prioritized because um, of the North Atlantic right whale and the fin whale, and, and at the time the humpback whale being on the, the endangered species list. So we actually um, deployed 10 marus, um, and they were effectively in, in what we sort of call a transit line so that we had um, at about 15 kilometer intervals, um, these devices from inshore to offshore, and then we also had more devices within the wind energy area at about six kilometers apart uh, with the aim of being able to localize those calls. Low frequency baleen whale calls can travel quite far, which means when you have a detection on a hydrophone, there is some uncertainty as to where precisely the whale was. And so through this localization array, we could get more accurate estimates of where those calling whales actually were. For the odontocetes, we had four CPOD sites um, that has been supplemented in, in the last couple of years. Um, but, but initially from 2014, we had four core sites in that, that transit line um, running east, east to, to west. And for the sea pods, the detection range is a little less of an issue um, than it is for the whales that, that can be detected over um, many kilometers. And um, whereas for the um, dolphin clicks that are detected by the sea pods, the range for that is probably up to about 1.8 kilometers. And for harbor porpoises, it's probably more on the range of about 500 meters. So the uncertainty associated with, with where the animal is, is, is lessened for these uh, dolphins and porpoise clicks. So on the next slide, I'm going to show um, the results for the whales briefly. And um, you can see uh, these show for the inshore site, the wind energy area, and offshore. Now, the inshore site was that site that was um, west of the wind energy area, so there's just one site. We had multiple marrows in the wind energy area, so that's why you can see those standard error bars, because it's been averaged across those uh, seven units. And then offshore, we had two sites, so again, there are standard error bars showing for the two sites. Um, this shows percent presence as a daily um, so this is the percent of days that um, a whale was detected. We have fin whales at the top, humpback whales, and then on the lower panels, the North Atlantic right whale. And previously, there was very, relatively little known about marine mammals offshore of Maryland because it wasn't considered really a particularly interesting area. It was an area that we knew that the whales migrated through, but it wasn't a feeding area, it wasn't a breeding area, and so there have been 
so rightly so, maybe less, less effort put into studying mammals <coughs> off this area. Um, but I think it just shows what you find when you look sometimes. Um, we did have, um, as we would expect, this sort of seasonal occurrence of these large whales. Um, they are migrating, obviously, from the, the feeding grounds in the autumn down south, and then they're moving back north again so that we get increased presence. North Atlantic right whales mainly present from November to April. Humpback whales, uh, December to May. And, and fin whales, um, again, mostly during the winter, um, that sort of November, November to April, May kind of time. So we certainly saw the seasonal patterns that we were expecting, but we also saw something that there was not entirely, uh, that they were not entirely absent during the summer, which is what we would expect if they're further north feeding, um, that they should not be present during the summer. So although we had lower detections, they were not zero. So just, just to note, we did, we did certainly have detections across all of these areas from inshore to offshore of these whales at at other times outside what we would consider the peak season. And, and I've put here the link to the report. So for the three years of baseline monitoring that we did, um, the, the report that we provided to BOEM is available from that website. And I'll show you that again at the end as well. Um, as I mentioned, we had on the next slide here, now I'm showing you the results from that localization array. The black box indicates the area where we uh, were fairly confident that we could actually localize. Obviously, we have higher accuracy within the array. As we move outside the area of our acoustic recorders, the error increases. So we, we mark that off with the, the black box. And what I thought was really interesting is you can see, obviously, that this looks like a scattered plot of dots. But if you look from the top, we've got January across February, March, and then down to the, the next um, row of panels down to December. Clearly, we have the most locations in November to uh, March, with a few in April. Um, although we had detections in the summer, we were not able to localize any of those calls. And that's kind of interesting, whether they weren't loud enough or like calling differently in the summer. But, but we, we don't have any localized from the summer, but we do have hundreds localized from November to April. And you can see those points uh, occur mainly within the wind energy area and offshore a bit, particularly in that, that northeast corner. And, and I just show here on the left um, some information from AIS data. This is showing shipping traffic density. So this Maryland wind energy area um, across the northeast there is where the shipping lane approaches to Delaware Bay are. And you can see in that left panel um, the shape above it. That's the Delaware wind energy area. Um, so the shipping lanes are going right between wow. them. Um, and not surprisingly, the highest ambient noise levels tended to occur in that region on the uh, eastern side of the wind energy area and offshore of it because of all that, that ship traffic. But we see that that's also where the right whales are. Um, so unfortunately, that they're going right through that area. On the next slide, I've got the odontocy results. And here, we've broken it up into uh, bottlenose dolphins, common dolphins, and harbor porpoises. Um, I won't go through how, how we decided if they were bottlenose or common dolphins, but, but um, feel free to ask questions or, or the details are in the report. The bottlenose dolphins um, were the, the dolphins that we classified were considered bottlenose dolphins for all of the year at the inshore site and within the wind energy area. And the bottlenose dolphins by far were most common during the summer months, from about May to October. And we can see very high presence, almost 100% daily presence uh, during those months. And that was relatively consistent across years. The harbor porpoises had almost the reverse distribution, uh, where they were most common during December to April. And that would fit in with what we're expecting with the harbor porpoise migration, where they're further um, north during the summer months, whether it's also some bottlenose dolphin avoidance, that's possible. Um, hard porpoises certainly have been found to do that in other places, um, but it, it was interesting that, that we very rarely seem to have co-occurrences of the bottlenose dolphins and hard porpoises. And offshore, the, the pattern was much less seasonal, and we think that's probably because in the summer we were getting some bottlenose dolphins, perhaps 
uh, of the offshore stock. And then in the winter, we, we were getting more frequent, uh, what are most likely common dolphins. So if I now move to the next slide. So we had learned a lot about marine mammals offshore of Maryland. And, and mostly when I talk about dolphins, that's where people expect that I'm talking. It's very common that I hear people say, oh yeah, I saw, I saw dolphins off Ocean City. Um, and so we, we knew bottlenose dolphins occur off the coast there, and, and um, there's a the northern coastal migratory stock that moves along this area um, during the summer, and then and then moves further south during the winter. So some of these patterns were not unexpected. Uh, but then as we began realizing that dolphins were coming into the bay, uh, we thought this was really interesting. Was it following a similar seasonal pattern or not? Where were they going in the bay? Were there particular hot spots? And so having um, obviously had a background in, in passive acoustic monitoring and, and we were able to get, were able to get some funding for, for two sea pods initially to put in the Patuxent River off our pier and, and the Potomac River, this was in collaboration with Janet Mann's team at, at Georgetown University. They were doing photo ID surveys in the lower Potomac so we thought that would be really great, uh, so complementary to their work, that we put an acoustic recorder in their study area so that we would have more continuous monitoring. Obviously, they can only go out on the boat uh, so often and in good conditions, and this would give a, a sort of more continuous picture of when the dolphins were there. Uh, what is the size of your bottlenose dolphin study area? Oh, is, in that, is that in reference to the offshore work or the Chesapeake Bay? If it's in terms of the Chesapeake Bay, I would say we're actually looking at the whole bay in terms of trying to understand distribution. But as I as I'll mentioned, for the passive acoustic monitoring, because as I said, the acoustic devices have limited rain detection ranges. Um, these devices are very good at giving us high temporal resolution, but you need many of these devices to give you the good spatial resolution. So right now, with the sea pod in the Tuxent River and the Potomac River, I say at most we have a 1.8 kilometer detection range, and I suspect it's much smaller than that because it's much shallower and the nature of the uh, topography there, I, I wouldn't be surprised if our detection range was within a kilometer. It will be slightly higher this year in the Potomac River, as I'll mention. We did deploy an acoustic recorder for dolphin whistles. Dolphin whistles are lower frequency. We will have a slightly larger detection range, most likely for the whistles. Um, last year, we also uh, collaborated with Dr. Matt Ogburn at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, who had a, a hydrophone that he was willing to deploy in the Rode River. Um, so that's wonderful. And they had previously done acoustic monitoring in the Rode River and just outside it into the main stem of the bay. And, and in this last year, we asked them to sample at a slightly higher sampling rate so that we could detect more of the dolphin calls. Um, so that's been really helpful to get an idea of what's happening in the upper bay. And then you'll see, obviously, all of those three stars are on the western shore. So more recently, my PhD student, uh, Ben Colbert, has also deployed a hydrophone in the eastern bay so that we can start to get an idea of how frequently the dolphins are going on the eastern uh, side of the Chesapeake Bay. So I'll go through um, some of these results on the next slide here. Um, I'll start with the Potomac River. So I'm going to start from the south from, from our monitoring sites and work my way north. Uh, for the Potomac River, we, we initially deployed a device in 2016. As I mentioned, whenever you throw something in the water, you've got to be a little mad to, to believe that it's going to work and you're going to get it back. Uh, we do that frequently <laughs> with mixed success. Mostly they have, these devices have worked very well. Um, unfortunately, in 2016, we deployed the hydrophone in May, and then we recovered it in October, but we then discovered that, sadly, at the end of June, it had stopped recording. So for 2016, we just have a bit over a month of data, but then we have um, full summer data sets for 2017, 2018, from that sort of mid-May time through to about the end of October. And on the graph here, on the x-axis, You've got the detection hours per day. So a detection positive hour is any hour in which at least 
uh, when uh, dolphin click train was detected. So it doesn't mean they were continuously there for five hours, but it means there were five hours in the day in which dolphins were detected. And what you'll note here is that from early June, right through, um, in most cases, to, to mid-August, that graph, those lines are above zero. So dolphins are being detected every single day for multiple hours. Um, and in fact, it goes largely through right up to, to mid-September, and then we see it really going down, where we have much more frequent occasions then of, of dolphins not being detected. But they are certainly still being detected even right until when we recovered them. You can see there, right at the end of October, we still have some of those lines peeping up there. Um, the dolphins were, were still detected. And, and across the, the three years of data, particularly the, the two, 2017 and 2018, where we had the whole summer, uh, that, that seems a fair, fairly consistent pattern there. If I go next to the Patuxent River, so this is off our pier in Solomons, um, definitely not as many detections. Still, I would say fairly frequent in the sense that we're detecting them weekly or so, um, but definitely not as much as in the Potomac. Here we have data from 2015, right from when we were first testing devices, and here I'm showing them till 2018. Our 2019 uh, data is still being processed. Um, so, so less frequent in the Patuxent River, but still fairly uh, regular occurrence. And in some cases, you can see in 2017, uh, with very large number of hours per day. Um, but I say that's not continuous hours per day. And I'll, I'll mention that again in a moment. Next, I'm now showing it for the Potomac and the Patuxent. Here, um, just to note, the x axis, the y axis has changed. Instead of detection positive hours, it's now detection positive minutes. So that's why you see, see different numbers there. Uh, but we're looking now at the, the dial pattern. We have uh, 0 is midnight, 12 is noon. And in both cases, we're generally seeing uh, that dolphins are more um, being detected more frequently during the night. Um, that may be that they're echolocating more at mm -hmm. night when it's dark. Um, and they're certainly not absent necessarily during the day. Those lines still obviously are above zero, even, even during daylight hours, but, but generally it was higher at night. So that, that could be to do with their echolocation patterns, or it could be to do with feeding. And on the next slide, I'm going to show you here the tidal state. I'm showing it for the Potomac River, but it's a similar pattern for the Patuxent. Um, here again on the y-axis, we have um, detection positive minutes, so minutes in which dolphin click trains were detected. And on the x-axis, we have tidal state. And tidal state here, we've done high water is zero. So it's hours plus or minus high water, where plus three hours be approximately mid-ebb, and then minus three hours approximately as mid flood, and we see that generally dolphin detections seem to be higher um, during those times when we have relatively high current flows, and, and that would be consistent with other places around the world where dolphins are curved. This probably is playing some sort of role in their ability to, to find and capture prey. On the next slide here, this is getting to my point about now detection duration. So the detection positive hours that I showed you sort of indicate how frequently dolphins are being detected. But if we actually look at the number of consecutive minutes they're detected, so to get an idea of how long were they in the detection range of the device, i.e. are they hanging out there or are they passing by? On the graph here, so we've got the um, duration on the x-axis. Uh, frequency on the y-axis. In red, we've got the Patuxent River, and in green, our Potomac River site. And the Potomac River, we have more detection, so the green bars are generally higher. But even it, when you look at the distribution, we can also see that it's much, um, much more skewed in the Patuxent. We have a lot of very short duration detections in the Patuxent, so indicating that where we are near the mouth of the Patuxent, they seem to be moving by. They don't seem to be just hanging out in that area. Whereas in the Potomac, we, we do have a lot of short detections, but we also have a number of detections that span up to 20 minutes. And my initial thought to that was, oh, so they're hanging around for 20 minutes. And that, that may be the case. Um, but then also talking to Janet, who's obviously 
and her team who are seeing the dolphins when they're out doing their boat surveys, they see some really large group sizes. And often those groups are, are sort of in subgroups and they described it as almost a train of dolphins that are going by. So, so there is also the potential that if these are multiple uh, different dolphins that are going by and that's, that's meaning that our, our click detections are, are lasting for those longer periods. And one of the things that we, we certainly want to do with this data is we can, based on the click detections and the inter-click intervals, so how um, quickly the clicks are produced um, and detected, we can uh, look at feeding buzzes. So this is as a dolphin is approaching its prey, as the distance gets shorter, it can be emitting that click and receiving that echo more quickly. So it will go click, 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 and it will accelerate to the point that we just hear it as a buzz. Um, I mean, we're talking about um, clicks uh, that are less than 10 milliseconds apart. So we have to look on a spectrogram to really see that. Um, but we can look at this, therefore, to see not only that the dolphins were there, but were they feeding? And that's sort of another indication of what are they doing in these different areas of the bay. On the next slide, uh, here are some results from um, the uh, hydrophone deployed by uh, Matt Alburn's team at Cirque in the, at the mouth of the Road River. Um, and here I'm showing the data for 2018. Uh, we, we haven't analyzed 2019 yet, but you can see from the deployment in mid-May, and we show it here up until mid-September. Um, again, sort of typical seasonal pattern. Now, this is nice up here. Um, Detections, in many cases, we've had to fit this in with other work as it wasn't, um, we didn't have specific dedicated grant funding. Uh, so this is really nice that here we have more continuous recordings and we can see here very much that peak in detections is occurring from sort of early June uh, through to, to late July. And then we get sort of the odd ones outside of that, but, but definitely that main sort of summer period that the dolphins are being detected. If I move to the next slide, so I've, I've talked about using clicks to detect whistles, and I, I mentioned about feeding buzz, buzzes that we can use to look at foraging behavior, but there's something else that we can do as well with the dolphin calls. Um, dolphins are unusual in that they have the ability to um, do vocal learning. So they, during the first few months of their lives, they will develop a signature whistle. And this is like a name. Um, it is uh, unique to the individual. And in most cases, they will keep that, that whistle. They, it will be conserved across their lifespan. So this gives us the ability to actually identify individual dolphins from these signature whistles. So we can identify individuals, and it can also give an idea of how many animals there were there. And we, our understanding of these calls is that they, they're used to maintain group cohesion. Um, so just like when you meet somebody new, usually one of the first things you say is your name, hi, it's Helen, and the person replies, hi, it's Tracy. And this is what we think the dolphins are doing. At sea, uh, we know that signature the how frequently they produce signature whistles varies. It can be from around 30% to 70% of the, the whistles they're producing. Uh, but we also know that they're most frequently produced when different groups meet at sea. So this idea that they're introducing each other um, when these might be, be animals they know, but it, it's maintaining this group cohesion. And we just got a little little example here. Um, I mean, these aren't really matching individuals to, to calls, but just to give you that idea of this, the, these different contours that we're seeing um, contains the information. There's been studies showing that unlike us, where we can, you can recognize the tone of my voice with dolphins, all that identity information seems to be conveyed in that contour. Uh, so we can use that to identify these individuals. And I've got on this next slide here an example. So this is a spectrogram where we have time on the x-axis. We've got the sound frequency on the y-axis. Uh, so we were sampling at 48 kilohertz, which effectively gives us a frequency range up to 24 kilohertz. Uh, as humans, we can hear up to about 20 kilohertz, although that does degrade with age. And I was disappointed recently to discover my hearing definitely doesn't go up to 20 kilohertz anymore. Um, but you can see in the colors here, so where you see the greens to more yellowy color, that's where more of the noise is. And a lot of the ambient noise is in the lower frequencies. Um, but then we can see these contours here. These are the dolphin whistles. And you can see this shape is repeated 
three times. And one of the characteristics of signature whistles is they tend to be repeated in, in this bout pattern that generally occurs within about a 10 second time period. Um, so this is just one example of, of seeing um, signature whistles in our acoustic recordings. And we followed the uh, classification procedure described in uh, Yannick et al. 2013. Um, so just to describe briefly the method, so we had the passive acoustic recorders. Um, I say we, the C pod will not give us the whistle information, so we used the acoustic recordings from the Road River, and we also compared it with two of our offshore sites um, off Ocean City, the inshore site that's about 12 kilometers off Ocean City, and the one in the center of the wind energy area that's about 30 kilometers off Ocean City. We took those recordings, we ran um, a, it's a software called PanGuard that's open, freely available. Uh, the whistle, we actually ran the click detector as well, but essentially this gives us a first pass at knowing where dolphins are in our recordings, which when you have multiple recorders recording for multiple years, that's, that's a lot of data to get through, so this helps reduce the amount that we have to look at. So once we've identified whistles, we then manually looked at the spectrograms uh, to see which of those satisfied the signature whistle criteria uh, using Raven. And then once we had those, we actually contoured them in a beluga um, so that we had those uh, signature whistle contours. And then we ran it through a neural network program, Art Warp, uh, produced by St. Andrews University in the UK to identify which of those whistles were matches and which uh, were unique. So essentially, if you think of photo ID where you're taking pictures of dolphins' dorsal fins, um, then uh, you're sort of looking for those nicks and scratches and then you get other photos and you see are you seeing the same pattern of nicks and scratches and we're sort of doing a similar thing where we have these contours these line patterns of these whistles and this neural network is seeing which ones does it match up um, so and and then we go through and manually verify humans are very good pattern detectors so we, we manually verify all of those um, categories and uh, this is just an example. So then what we can do is with these different sites and over time, we can see how many dolphins uh, we detected and when were the same dolphins detected again. Uh, so we get this, this time series of when different dolphins were detected. And, and a huge thank you to my team, particularly Amber Fandel um, and Kirsten Silva, who, as you can see these numbers, it, it, there's a lot of time and effort. Right now, there's still a lot of... This, although we do use automation and, and machine learning, there is still a lot of manual verification. So they've been through over 16,000 hours of, we've had over 16,000 hours of recordings of which they analyzed over 3,500. And from those, we have identified over 1,200 individual dolphin signature whistles. Um, so that's a lot of individual dolphin whistles that we've, we've now cataloged and obviously just like with a photo ID catalog, this is something we can continue um, to add to and match to as needed and that's within the Chesapeake Bay and, and in the Atlantic off Maryland. And this diagram shows you for those signature whistles that were detected when they were detected again. Um, so we had 213 individual signature whistles that reoccurred so that's the same dolphin came within the detection range of our detector again so indicating some site fidelity at least that they were returning through that area the longest reoccurrence was 689 days um, we had reoccurrences amongst all three sites now we did expect that we would have reoccurrences between our inshore site and our wind energy site offshore of Ocean City. We do expect that that was most likely the northern uh, coastal migratory stock of dolphins and that they may well uh, be, be moving between those areas. So, so that was, um, it was great to see that, but it wasn't as surprising as then also having um, a couple of the signature whistles turn up in the Road River. So the northern migratory stock seemed to if, seemed to be coming into the Chesapeake Bay, um, and it's interesting that from Janet's work, they seem to be coming from other populations um, in, or so, supposedly from other stocks into the Chesapeake Bay as well, the southern stock and the, the North Carolina eastern estuarine stock. 
So right now, I, I can't, those signature whistles, I can't say specifically which populations they're from because as far as I'm aware, we haven't documented how signature whistles match to different populations at this point. Um, but I think it's an extremely valuable tool. And one of the things that we're hoping to do is, is more automate it further so that it is less time intensive to do. And I mentioned this passive acoustic monitoring is very good at giving us high temporal resolution data. Um, it's not quite as good at giving us the high spatial resolution unless we have a lot of devices. And the Chesapeake Bay is a big place. <laughs> um, I mean, I, we'd have to have a lot of devices to really cover the bay. So right now, we've sort of been strategic in terms of we used a site that was near and easy for us to deploy and recover in collaboration with Janet Mann's team in the Potomac. That worked well. But in thinking about where else should we be putting these sites, we, we really wanted to increase our spatial coverage. Um, just before I mention that, I do, this is a reminder on this slide, that although I'm focusing on the dolphins, we have to remember they are part of the ecosystem. And we know that they're very sensitive to sound. They're going to be sensitive to other background sounds, such as shipping. Um, and very likely, shipping into Baltimore could increase. Um, so we're very interested to, to monitor those background noise levels and see if that seems has any uh, impact on the dolphin calls or occurrence, but also on their prey. It's so common that we think, well, we're not sure if this is directly affecting the dolphins or if it's through a relationship with their prey. So understanding uh, fish calls, which is something that has not been as well studied, um, and using passive acoustic monitoring to understand uh, the biological component of uh, fish calls and fish occurrence, we have some uh, acoustic telemetry of fish as well, um, but I think this can all help to piece together the sort of understanding of what is driving the occurrence and distribution of dolphins in the Chesapeake Bay. Because most likely they are coming in to feed, although we know from recent the recent um, birth uh, event that they, they are giving birth here too. So in order to understand, it, I, I mean, if I only have so many acoustic recorders, where should I be putting them? I really wanted to know more about well, where are dolphins occurring in the bay? Are there any particular hotspots that we might want to, to put our acoustic recorders to learn more? And to do that, I realized I need a really big observation network. And that's hard to do with a small team. Uh, we did do um, some aerial surveys. Um, but uh, we haven't had a single dolphin sighting yet. I think that shows when you're doing a one-hour flight. These animals are very mobile. They're moving, moving in and out of the bay. That it's very fluid, and and we didn't get a lot of data from that. But our system science project was a much bigger success than I, I certainly could have anticipated. And I want to say a huge thank you. We worked with the the National Aquarium, who were responsible for um, live stranding responses. To, to think about this, because there's obviously implications whenever you're bringing in the public, and particularly with something like an app where I'm not doing one-on-one -on -one training, these, this is going out to people that I will not necessarily have personal interaction with. We wanted to be very careful about how we do this, and, and we continue to think about that um, as we, we continue to move forward as well. So a huge thank you. Um, to those who provide Noah, who provided advice on this as well, um, we made the decision that we wanted everybody who was going to use the app to log in, so that we would have an email address to contact people with. Uh, that allows us for for the research purposes to follow up on any reported dolphin sightings, but it also just allows us to know who our user base is. And anyone who logs in then immediately is taken to some responsible wildlife viewing guidelines. And I've just shown some screenshots here, the type of information about making sure they give the dolphins space, that they don't swim with the dolphins, they don't touch the dolphins, making sure they're what these are. This is a protected species. We certainly don't want to encourage any type of inappropriate behavior uh, by people around dolphins. But we know that people are seeing dolphins. And, and even before we launched the app, I was getting, once I, I made it aware that I was um, researching dolphins, people were emailing me sightings. And so I knew that people were seeing them. We knew that there had been some sightings reported to Maryland DNR. They were out there. Um, and we, we set include the stranding numbers so that we make sure if anyone does see a stranding, they report that to the appropriate authorities. Um, so we launched. Oh, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Let's see if it'll let me advance the slide. Hi, folks. Can you hear us online? If you go on the okay, on the right. Yeah. 
click on that one. Go down. Oh, yes. Yeah. And that could be what it is. Do you think right click that? <laughs> Sorry, guys, we're having a little problem. Oh, okay. We have good people in the room. Thank you. Oh, no, it came back. Oh, oh okay, oh. let's check that out. Sorry. Okay. It's just a bunch of junk. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so, so this uh, sorry, this slide summarizes some of what I just said. Um, and so, essentially, <coughs> oh, I'll move up. Sorry for the web people too. Okay. That we launched the app. The app is. It was a website initially where people could view and report sightings in late June 2017, and then we released the the mobile version of the app for Android and, and Apple phones in 2018. And I gave. I well, I have given. Um, a lot of presentations to various nature societies, sailing clubs, and, and public science events. Um, our initial grant to fund the app by the Chesapeake Bay Trust really was to raise awareness that they felt that there had been a community of people who were interested in sort of the, the traditional sort of blue crab and uh, an oyster restoration of Chesapeake Bay, but that this perhaps gave us the potential to reach a different audience and to raise awareness about wildlife in the bay and, and really the, the benefits of, of protecting the wildlife um, and, and resources in the Chesapeake Bay. So we tried to do a, a lot of public outreach uh, associated with this work. So the app itself, um, we tried to make it as simple to use as possible. Uh, we have over 5,000 users, and we have over 1,000 confirmed sightings. So that's just from the two years so far, basically summer 2017 to 2019. Um, and we do a careful process, and, and a huge thank you to Jamie Tester, who's here in the room, um, who goes through and checks all of those so we make sure that there aren't people just pressing by mistake, that they've provided some sort of description or backup information uh, that can make us feel confident that this really was a dolphin sighting. Um, and if multiple people have reported what seems to be the same dolphin group, we, we make sure we remove that. So that our final database um, includes just these confirmed sightings. And I'm going to show you here. Oh, oh. Yeah, sorry, moving slides. There we go. Um, so on this next slide, it shows you for, I've got it here for 2017, which was from June, and from April in 2018, um, those confirmed sightings. Wow. Uh, we had a lot in the Upper Bay in 2018. Um, and it, it is interesting, some of the things that, that we see here, I mean, there's obviously the sort of, is it where the people are, or is it where the dolphins are? And I think that's where complementing it with our acoustic monitoring is really valuable so that we can see um, the seasonal pattern does seem consistent with our acoustic detection. So it's not just that people are out in the summer, that, that we really do seem to have more dolphins in the summer. So here I'm showing uh, these maps for May, June, July of 2018. So generally at the beginning of the seasons and in, the, in the spring and early summer, we have a higher number of sightings in the lower bay, and then as we move into midsummer, we generally have much higher sightings in the upper bay. But as I say, the dolphins are very mobile. I do not think of these as static points. They're not just hanging out there and staying there. We know the dolphins are moving in a very mobile way from what we've seen. Um, and on the next one, I've got August, September, October. Oh. How do you confirm a dolphin sighting? Um, so uh, Jamie will check the sighting to see uh, what description they have provided. Um, so if it's, if it's a fairly detailed description, I'm here, oh yeah, they definitely saw dolphins. If it's a little more borderline, uh, we ask, uh, we, we will use that. We have, as say, the email for every user. We will follow up with an email to ask if they can provide further details. Um, they can upload photos and video, uh, so if they've done that, we can also use that in our verification process. Um, so this just summarizes the seasonal occurrence. It's a very, very distinct seasonal pattern there. Oh, what are the salinity ranges in the north? Okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on, actually, because I'm hopefully going to answer that question at least partially. So I had a student this summer as part of the Maryland Sea Grant Research Experience for Undergraduates who analyzed our dolphin sightings in relation to environmental data. Um, so I'm going to show some of those uh, preliminary results. So she was looking at the, the weekly number of sightings in relation to tidal phase, the spring neap, um, tides, 
the weekly temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. Now, I will say that the preliminary results I'm going to show you now, weekly number of dolphin sightings, we know that there could potentially be an effect of, of how many users we have. We do have the information on use of the app and page views through Google Analytics, so that's something that, that we are planning to incorporate. But if I show you the preliminary results, we did it for the lower, middle, and upper bay. I'm just going to show you the preliminary results for the middle bay. They are similar for the upper and, and lower bay in that all three variables were significant, temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. It's just the values are slightly different, as you'd expect. We have lower salinity values in the lower bay than in the upper bay. So for the middle bay here, you can see the peak uh, of Dolphin sightings is generally sort of 8 to 10 uh, PSU of, of salinity. And, and then temperatures in association with the higher occurrence in the summer generally have dolf higher dolphin sightings when there's warmer temperatures. With dissolved oxygen, it's a little bit more like salinity where we've got that, that sort of quadratic curve um, and a peak of around four, at around 4. So they're going for mid salinities, mid dissolved oxygen. Um, so, um, oh, sorry, I'm just looking at the, you the can questions. You finish if you like. Okay. Yeah. So we get, yeah, near the end here. So, and, and so what we did with this preliminary model that, that we're now adding 2019 data to, so the model was trained with 2017 and 2018 data. And then we tested it with the data from 2019, which during this student's time uh, was from April through to mid-June. And we see that the red line on this graph shows the predicted sighting. So based on the environmental conditions, that temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, uh, the, that's how many sightings we would have expected. And then the blue line shows you how many sightings we actually had reported. And you can see how closely those actually seem to match. Um, so we were, we were pleasantly surprised about how, how well that seemed to be matching, particularly because we had lower sightings in 2019 and we were unsure if that might be because of doing reduced publicity or if it really was uh, fewer dolphins. And, and based on seeing this model and also from what we've seen so far the acoustic data, it certainly seems to be the case there were fewer, seemed to be fewer dolphins in 2019. So uh, since I'm running a little late here, I'll go through this fairly quickly. But I mean, at this point, I feel like we're just starting to open Pandora's box to understand, yes, this idea that we knew that bottlenose dolphins could occur in the Chesapeake Bay, and we thought they were more rare to occasional. And now we're seeing, actually, they are much frequent than we thought. And, and Janet's photo ID has shown they've been able to ID over 1,000 dolphins. Um, so they're, they're coming quite large numbers into the bay. And it, it's just amazing, really, that somewhere so, so near urban centers that, that they managed to do this. But I think it's because the Chesapeake Bay is so big, and it has so many tributaries. Until you put all that information together, like we did in the app, it, it, I just don't think it was as obvious when you're, when you're looking at, at smaller scales. And, and certainly with the acoustic data, we're really excited to continue the work with the signature whistles and to track dolphins and also the, the feeding buzzes to understand that foraging. And, and lastly, to understand more about this soundscape that I mentioned in the Chesapeake Bay and how this is changing um, as the bay gets restored, but also as potentially there's more shipping traffic. Um, so a huge thank you to all the people and funders involved. Uh, this work has involved a huge number of people. It has been a very small, in terms of funding, it's been a very small project. Um, but I really appreciate everyone who's volunteered their time and efforts on this um, to, to really put this all together. And I'll end with this slide. Oh, and in case anyone has any questions or wants to view any of the, the papers. Great. Thank you. You can go ahead and take Ann and Barbie's question, then we'll take some in the room. The answers, or Barbie, I guess, is the next one. Um. Okay, okay. Can you read the question? So um, the question was, what are the salinity ranges in the northern bay to rivers? And that really depends on what parts of them you include. Um, in the preliminary analysis that the undergraduate student did this summer, she took an average over quite a large area uh, within the middle bay and upper bay. And obviously then it's sort of averaging across what are the higher salinity main stem values up to 
what can be almost effectively fresh water up the rivers. I mean, I think the dolphins are certainly capable of going into some very fresh water, but say they're not staying there, they're, they're moving, they're going up there, they're moving back down. Um, so they are very much um, moving, as I was saying, they're moving around the bay. We're not seeing them just sort of sitting in one place. And so I think they're probably following prey up the rivers, um, but, then, but then they're moving back out again. The next question, Anne Weaver says, do you encourage them to take photos? The aim of the app was really to have people report what they had seen without trying to influence them in the sense that I certainly don't want anyone trying to get close to the dolphins to take photos. Now, obviously, they are bottlenose dolphins. Sometimes we will see that they are bow riding boats and have approached boats. Um, but we very much emphasize that people should give the dolphin space and if they have photos, they can submit them, but we certainly don't try to encourage it. We do share any photos we receive with Janet Mann's team and, and their photo ID catalog, which, which they also work with the, the Atlantic photo ID catalog. Um, but we, we ourselves are only using those photos for verification. So even if they're fairly distant, we, we are not trying to get them to take fit, really close fin shots or anything like that. Are there questions in the room? I have a question. I know you said that um, you couldn't tell what um, stocks were present for your past yes. I mean, Do you know offhand what, what the stocks are? So, um, I mean, there's a fairly complicated um, stock structure where, the, the, I mean, there's lots of new dolphins all along the Atlantic coast, and there's a lot of different stocks that have been identified. So I say for, for offshore of Maryland, that's considered to be the north, north, um, northern migratory coastal stock. There is, as I mentioned, an offshore stock as well, which our more offshore recorders are, are most likely picking up. And then um, really, if you, when I looked at the pictures and the stock assessments, it looked like it was most likely the southern migratory stock that was thought to go into the Chesapeake Bay. So I wouldn't have been surprised if none of the Road River ones had matched with our ones off Ocean City. Um, but the fact that they did, and the fact that Janet also has photo ID of dolphins showing that, that those in the Chesapeake can move north is, is interesting. And, and I think it's certainly sort of raising some questions about, you know, is, is the Chesapeake Bay this mixing bowl? I mean, we know that most likely they're mating there, they're giving birth there, they're feeding there. Um, but we're also seeing what are most likely more than one more than one stock going in there. Thanks. So, yeah. And I have a question. So does MIMS use any of your information for their stock assessment uh, work? Well, I mean, it's so fairly stock. early in our project. Um, yeah. I mean, as far as I'm aware, it wasn't used in uh, the last assessment. But I say we haven't even published a, a paper yeah. yet. We've got them in the works. Um, and, and Janet, too, her work similarly started in in 2015, so we don't have published papers. So I mean, I, I would honestly, as we we begin to scientifically publish this work, I, right. I would imagine it could be used. Um, so would they use, would they go into the Chesapeake? Because would it be more federal waters that they do, or no? They'll. Look um, I mean, they still. I mean, the, the stock the assessments church. still have maps which which show some sites. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously the, the Chesapeake Bay with it, you've got Maryland and, and Virginia yeah. waters, but you've got federally protected species. Right. Okay. And, I, and I really appreciate, I do know that um, I've had a couple of calls um, in terms of the 301 bridge construction and then also some tower construction in Baltimore um, that we were contacted because people at NIMPS had suggested they talk to us because they need to consider bottlenose dolphins and potential mitigation if they're going to be doing something like pile driving or other very loud sounds that, that could potentially cause disturbance. Do you, do you see them avoiding loud areas in the Chesapeake or? In the bone wind area? Um, well, of course, there is no wind farm as yet yeah, okay. in the wind energy so Chesapeake area. Maybe, and, and so we'll, we'll see. We haven't, um, so yeah, certainly if, if activities occur that produce loud sounds, that's definitely something that we could look at. I think right now, you know, a question I get asked so, so often is you need to know, well, is this what sort of normal occurrence versus, you know, what if there is an event, what is less? So you really need that baseline data right. to begin with. So, you know, okay. This is how often they occur and, and the general variability, natural variability. And so then, if an event occurs, we'll be able to tell was there an effect. Thanks. 
Um, thank you. This is great. Um, I was wondering for the fish acoustics, if you know, um, so it's early on, kind of like, do you know actual, can you tell species from that, or are you just telling the presence absence of fish in general? Mm. Well, Ben's sitting right next to you there, so it's his PhD. <laughs> I do know that the, uh, Boehm, I, I'm pretty sure Boehm ha has been funding a study to try try and um, create a fish call catalog, or I know it was in the environmental study plan, um, because I think that's something that has been missing. I mean, there's been quite a lot of money invested, a lot from the Navy as well, on um, marine mammal calls and behavior, and, and much less so on the fish. So I think, I mean, fish can be a little harder in the sense that they produce often low frequency calls and it might be associated with a certain behavior like associated with reproduction spawning so we, we need to characterize that a lot better but I think that would be a really important piece to add do you know which fish species are there like targeted species the dolphin are coming after like striped bass or is, is there something there do you know anything about what they're feeding on well it's very Hayden I mean, the diet information is relatively limited. It's usually from standard animals, and then obviously many of those may have been sick before and have an empty stomach. From the, right. the study that was done, I mean, it seen, they'll feed on a variety. That they, they are yeah. generalists, which does make it a lot harder. In some ways, I, I like that the blue whales were, were so specialized on krill. It, it does help. But for the for the bottlenose dolphins, that we know it could be feeding on something from menhaden up to uh, striped bass. Uh, one of the photos I showed was of a dolphin in the Chesapeake feeding on a shad. Um, so I, I suspect that they'll feed, they'll feed opportunistically on a variety of things, but it also wouldn't surprise me if, like in Scotland, where we saw an influx of large numbers of dolphins associated with Atlantic salmon coming in, you know, maybe similarly there's something in the Chesapeake that, that triggers more coming in. Right. So um, certainly, I mean, there's obviously a lot of fisheries data in the Chesapeake, so that, that's really helpful to look at that in relation to the dolphin yeah. Okay, any other questions in the room, online? Oh, sorry. All right, let's That's see. a fantastic shock. Um, have you guys looked into like detections of other marine mammals in the bay, like harbor porpoise? Or so we have, I mean, the sea pod will detect porpoises. As yeah. far as I'm aware, we haven't had a harbor porpoise detection. I mean, I was super excited about the harbor porpoise detections offshore of Maryland because most passive acoustic monitoring, because there has been a large whale focus, doesn't go anywhere near the frequency of detecting an egg harbor porpoise at 130 kilohertz. Um, so I was really excited to, to see the pattern off of Maryland offshore, but as far as I'm aware, none we of We don't us. usually have our gear in the water when we tend to see those animals in inside winter, the CTK, but we do have a device that we're hopefully going to put out. During the month, we'll be here this year, so we could run that. Yeah, this is the first year we're planning to leave a seapod out over the winter in the Chesapeake. I mean, obviously, there's there's a risk, at, you know, with weather, ice, other things like that. I've been a little cautious as these devices cost a lot of money. Um, but yeah, we, we are thinking, because we've seen, I say dolphins are coming into the bay right through to November. We thought, okay, finally, let's, let's leave it over the winter, just see what detections we have. And of course, that means we will be able to test porpoises too. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, if you're interested in getting a PDF copy of the presentation, um, Helen says it's okay. You can email me at tracy.gill at noah.gov and I'll be happy to send it. Or if you want an MP4 copy, we can also send that starting tomorrow. So, Helen, thanks for a terrific presentation. Thanks for coming up. And uh, if you have any questions, you can follow up with Helen. I think her email's there. Um, yeah, and then the report's right, linked right there, too, which is great. So thanks again, Helen, for a terrific talk. Thanks.